three. Michelle. Yes. Beginnings are very important. Beginnings. Tell me uh, how it started here, uh, cannabis movement, medical cannabis, legalization. How did it start here? Where was it at? Well, um, 14 years ago in 2000, um, the Hawaiian legislature kind of recognized what was going on in California um, and saw that the state was not falling into the ocean or burning to the ground from complete and utter chaos by the release of this plant under the people. So you had that, um, which kind of lubricated the wheels. But in addition to that, here in Hawaii, they've only been a state since 59. So up until 1950s, marijuana was still an embedded part of the culture here. Right. People here still use holistic herbal medicine right. commonly throughout the right. culture and throughout the islands. Right. Some of the islands, there's so little health care that that's pretty much your sole right. Right. source of health care. So I think that the, the population here was ready for an opportunity, and I think they were just worried about the federal government backlashing because when they were taken over, which right. they basically were, right. um, we really put our foot down, I guess is the way to put it. We really asserted ourselves as a, as a powerful country. And I think a lot of things that are not done here quickly are, are that way because they're concerned about federal backlash. Right. Um, and when they saw that California wasn't getting that backlash, right. they said, well, you know, the people want it back. Right. Um, and they actually passed a, a relatively conservative law um, for the time, because California is pretty wide open. And um, it's a pretty conservative law, and they've been stuck with it here for 14 years. And this year, coming up, 2015, they're really hoping to change a lot of that. The legislature is really friendly towards the idea of establishing a dispensary structure here. We're talking about reciprocity, which I think is going to be a requirement. There's far too many states now uh, not to have a reciprocal agreement for states with licensing. Um, and we are trying to get state of Hawaii to follow uh, the state of New Mexico's example and make health insurance um, cover medical marijuana. So we're really hoping to make some really big meaningful changes this year. Now that, that's happened in New Mexico for New Mexico legislature. For an employment. For employment rights that they can get to medical insurance to pay for prescribed right. cannabis there. And for a lot of people here, there's, there's a lot of money problems here. I mean, people live in mass. I was just talking to some people in Laia, which is the top part of the island, and they're, one of their biggest concerns and complaints about the community there is that people are living three and four generations to a home because it's so expensive, the rent here. And only half the people who own homes live in that. I mean, most people rent it out as, as income, so, that's, yeah. That's interesting because uh, we went to Jamaica uh, several years ago, and it seems to me, just from my observation, that more you have dependency on tourism for dollars that you have a disparity uh, in incomes and stuff. Yeah, and, it's and, a huge and, risk. Yes, it's a big risk. Here in particular. Right. And, you know, so I mean, for a lot of people here that getting the license sometimes is expensive. I talk to a lot of people and I, I, I help get people connected to doctors that do um, like sliding fee scales and, you know, discount sponsoring right. and stuff like that for veterans and students. Right. And, civil service workers and librarians and you know teachers and you know because three hundred dollars for a license because a and, and you're trying to buy a plant to save you from buying hundreds and hundreds of dollars in pills you know the money speaks volumes when you talk about prescription medications especially when you go into like any type of social program that the government sponsors whether it be uh, Medicaid, Medicare, here it's called MedQuest, you know, VA veterans are using probably a billion, if not more, dollars of taxpayer money is being spent to buy people prescription pills that makes them sicker oftentimes. Really? Makes them sicker? That's what I was going to ask you. What yeah. questions okay, I was going to ask you? Okay, we'll go to the next question. I'm sorry. PTSD and vets, mm -hmm. you've answered some of that, uh -huh. but uh, with medical marijuana, medical marijuana program they have here, do they have anything that allows them to be treated? Well, um, the way the state is written their law, 
every doctor licensed to conduct practice in the, in the state of Hawaii is authorized to recommend medical marijuana. However, the federal government has an injunction basically against their doctors that work at the VA. Um, so what you have is a lot of veterans who cannot afford, like me, who cannot afford to go somewhere besides the, the VA hospital. And then their doctors will, my doctor still calls it an illicit, even though I'm sitting right in front of her, and she'll say, do you use any other illicit drugs besides marijuana? And I say, look, it's not an illicit drug. We live in Hawaii. Yeah, but according to the federal government, I'm like, you know, I don't want to argue semantics with you, so we're just not going to discuss it. I use something that's legal here where I live, and I've chosen to live somewhere it's legal, specifically so I can use medicine that right. works. And so then you're you're a, kind of a, a, a medical refugee yes. here. Yes, and there are so, a lot of medical refugees right. all over the United States right, right now, in particular children. Yes, in California, in, in Colorado, it's epidemic. Yes, it is. I mean, yes. there's so many people that have flooded in from so many different states, especially for because the they have to go to jail, right, or take care of their kids. Yes, right. And it, it breaks my heart, you know. Well, it really does. We're trying. We're trying to change that in Texas. Right? I understand yeah. that. We we really need to change in Texas. In I I lived in Dallas for a decade. In my mind and my heart, I believe true crime is those is really committed by those that are enforcing the law. And and a lot of them don't understand that they're yes. <laughs> that they're really. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I go here to the um, congressional hearings and stuff, and you'll have officers come in, and they, ignorance is powerful. And when you don't know any better, you don't know. And so they've been taught that these subsidies, and they get taught by who? By the department. And the department is funded by crime. And, and that's a sad thing to say, you know, guys, if y'all don't have enough crime going on, we don't need as many officers. We're going to have to fire some of y'all. So, you know, so that it's in their best interest to keep crimes crimes. And then they tell them. Especially uh, prohibition cannabis crimes right. because they get so much tax dollars. Billions. By, billions. By the billions. more arrests that they billions. make. So they really lay aside other crimes. They don't investigate so they can bust people for cannabis uh, type crimes so that they can get more tax dollars. Right. Well, you have, so that's really a catch The numbers too. really ring loud when you yes. start. Because it's easy to say marijuana, for example, is a gateway drug because right. generally marijuana is present when other harder drugs are present. But most of the time I find that people use marijuana to like recover from the use of it. You know what I mean? They're right. using marijuana as a buffer right. to recover, right. not as... Like, I got high from weed and now I want coke. It's not the same thing. But it's, it's easy to make that argument. Any argument that's going to make your dollars come inward instead of outward is going to be popular. A lot of it is they will buy the street, but the drugs they have really destroyed their body. And actually, they're using it to heal it and get their body back to equilibrium again so that it can function properly and naturally. Right. And, uh, so and that's it's cheap. It's cheap just, to put a seed in the ground. Yes. You know, it's expensive to hire chemists and buy microscopes right. and, you know, scanning electron yes. microscopes and all these other things. Quick question. Yes. On, uh, on, on the law here for medical cannabis, are y'all able to grow at least two or three plants? We're required. Some? You're to required. Grow you have to grow your own. So, well, that's wonderful. I think that's the best it, life. It me. seems like a great thing, and I don't want, and we're not looking to remove that yeah. privilege for right. people, but we're restricted to seven plants at a time right. uh, per patient, right. one ounce of usable marijuana per plant. Right. And if you utilize the federal government standard right. for the people that they still to this day, I think there's four left, right. that still receive federally funded medical marijuana right. in a tin can every month in the, in the mail, they are actually administered almost nine ounces a month, right? right. And when you put the seven plants that you're allowed to have in the cycle, you're only going to get two to three plants maturing every month, right. and that's if you grow them in a cycle. So you basically force people into a position where they're only getting, if half, of what they need for their really? medicine so by good. making people grow it themselves. Right. Okay. And then you have people who are terminally ill right. before they even look for this medicine. Right. And then they get that card, and now you've got three months to live with cancer, and you're in chemo, and now grow your own plants. Good luck. Quick question. Yes. If they increase the amount, 
plans that they were able to have with that alleviate the problem some? I told you that guy probably well, alleviate it some um, for people who aren't on a short term clock. But, but like I said, if you're if you're looking at a three to six month term of life and you're that ill, you're not cultivating, it's going to be a very difficult issue. So they offer, you can have a caregiver right. and assign someone to grow your pot for you, right. but they can only do one other person. Right. So that person that you can trust to grow something medical for you right. is now restricted only one patient, instead of being able to grow for many patients and offer a large number of right. people quality medication. Right. So it's. It's one of those things where it's good, but it's good, but it's so good, it's but, over yeah, and over. And that they did most, increase our yeah. plant number. They used to have it as three mature plants, and they did increase it to seven this year. Yeah. But once again, you're only pulling about two two ounces an average per month, and if you have severe medical problems, that's probably not going to cut it. Okay, distribution by pharmacy, pharmacy distribution. Is that is that coming? Is that here? Or are they trying to get a network connection? Yeah, we don't have a dispensary where. No dispensary structure like they have in California and Arizona. It's all this place where you can just go in somewhere. Right. Motorcycles. Okay, we were, we were talking about distribution. Yeah, uh, okay. So, um, we don't have a dispensary structure set up here like they do in many other states. Right. Um, currently, you can only access your medicine through growing your own or through appointing a caregiver. Um, and currently, they have a task force put together that's working to create a piece of legislation that will establish that dispensary structure. Um, this year, they also changed over the responsibility and control of the marijuana program from the Department of Public Safety to the Department of Health, which is a really substantial move. Is that a good move? Yes. Um, we have a lot of uh, people at the Department of Health that are far, you can't treat medicine like a crime. And Department of Public Safety is only familiar with that type of procedure. Right. Right. So you've got to basically take health and put it in with the health professionals. So there's a lot of, like, they're establishing standards for submitting new ailments, for example. So it's really, it's been a good thing. Okay, what does the future look like for Hawaii? Well, everybody is looking up. You know, like, um, most people I've spoken to in the past legalization here in Hawaii for the future? Well, um, everybody is really hopeful and positive, and the task force is really in touch with the idea that the people here are comfortable with this medicine, want this medicine, you know, for their kids even. You know, we have a lot of children involved in the movement. We have um, a little girl named uh, MJ that has Jubet syndrome, right. and her mother has been taking meticulous records. Jerry is wonderful, and she's been able to take those records with a demonstrable syndrome like epilepsy, where she's got seizures, she's got recognizable types of seizures, and then the parents are able to say, look, you're giving her this, and this is, and we're able to actually have a quantifiable number of frequency, um, instead of a qualitative concept of lack of pain, or concept of easing stress. This is an actual count applied manifestation of an illness, and so it's really done leaps and bounds, I think, through the movement here. Um, a lot of people want to see dispensaries immediately. Um, we're hoping to get dispensaries in the next, well, next 12 months, definitely. Um, but there's also talk of recreational marijuana, delegalization, you know, just right. get rid of prohibition altogether right. when it involves marijuana. Um, the current gubernatorial candidate are one of the four. Right. Um, there's only one in support of medical marijuana openly. The other three are against it, right. which I, I seriously have concerns about regarding Medical marijuana in the state that's had it for 14 years. But 
Um, Jeff Davis is the gubernatorial candidate in support of it, and he wants to actually regulate it like alcohol and tobacco. Um, and a lot of people say you really support that. Um, the Drug Policy Action Group here in Hawaii sponsored a, um, a survey that was done at the beginning of the year, and I think it's 86% of people think that marijuana should now be criminal here in Hawaii. And I believe it was like 66% was the number that wanted to see dispensaries. Well, tax and regulate is really the way to go, really. I mean, right. uh, because you, you not only get tax dollars again for your government, but you save so much money for court costs, criminal incarceration. So it's a, it's a double whammy of benefit. I mean, it's just a win-win for the state when they do it. Well, you take you take save another right. You take you take money away from cartels and from black market enterprises that really are not interested in somebody's health. You know, they provide a service, but they're not interested in your health. They're interested in making money. And I've, I've talked to drug dealers, yeah. real-time drug dealers. Right. I know people who have been in the federal penitentiary right. for, for drug dealing. Right. And they will tell you, they don't want weed legal. Yeah. They make their money on weed. They do. They do. And most cartels make a substantial portion of their budget money out of marijuana sales. None of them want to see weed yeah. legal. In Mexico, it's 80% of, of cartel money really comes from marijuana distribution. Right. It's cheap to process. It's the only it's the only available drug that you can actually sell the same way you got it. Right. Everything else involves processing. So they can they can cut it off the ground and if you're good you can dry it and press it and it'll finish drying on the way. Right. And you can ship bales of it. So one last question. Absolutely. Uh, Tracy told me that you're uh, with uh, a magazine or something. Here yes. That, that could you speak just a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I, I write for the Kalana Nakua. Kalana Nakua means famous are the flowers. It's a, a song here in Hawaii as well. Right. Um, and we promote medical marijuana. We promote knowledge in the plants. Um, I write editorial. So right. I do interviews with, um, I've done an interview with the, peacock, with the author and illustrator of If the Peacock Finds a Pot Leaf right. and If the Peacock Discovers Hemp Island. Um, I've also done interviews with concentrate makers, I've done interviews with uh, hydroponic shop owners, um, and then I've done like just my own editorial kind of stuff. Um, we try to make ourselves seen and known. We try to encourage other people who are for medical marijuana to be seen and known because when you're this invisible, unknown number and mass of people, no one will listen to you when you're a phantom. So really encouraging people to assert themselves. And our and our um, publisher was actually arrested and held over a weekend for receiving a package. Um, so we, we suffer for our movement too. And we don't ask anyone to do anything we don't do ourselves. I've been arrested under this video as well and it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It's so important to be involved. That's you know everybody needs to get involved because a lot of people stay try to stay incognito, but when they get busted, then they want people oh. that, that are out there and advocate for them to help them, and they need to get out on the front lines. And we need to win this war. I mean, the thing about it is that I I tell myself is that for 53 years the federal government has waged war against us, and we haven't fought back, and we need. Not with bullets, but with a ballot. We need to right. we need to register the vote. We need to vote. We need to get out there. And we need to tell these politicians that we're not going to do it no more. We're not going to take it no more. And there, are, you know, in the United States alone, there's probably 25 to 40 million people that smoke on their own. That's yes. a big, huge voice yes. that the politicians would listen to, and changes would be made if these people would come out and take a stand. A lot of people I talk to say that the government won't listen if you don't have deep pockets. And the first thing I have to say about that is that people with deep pockets won't talk to politicians that don't have a seat. So take away their office, and they won't have that money anymore. And they know that too. You have to speak their commodity, and their commodity is votes. So I agree with you completely. Well, Michelle, I thank you very much for taking so your time much. out and speaking nice to us. Right you too. And uh, I, I will send you a link to this interview after I get it uh, worked up. And, uh, <laughs> Process. It'll be great to see it, yes, you know. Yes. And, uh, I try to get it out. To, I'll try to get it out to people here on the island. <laughs>